Amen to the good singing. We welcome you all today to Lone City. We've got a lot of visitors. We're thankful you come our way and hope you'll all stay for lunch afterwards uh, in our annex after our worship this morning. And uh, after that, we'll have another 1230 service. Brother Miller will speak again at that time. But we have certainly been treated already. Our Bible class was a wonderful time together. For the day, Miller, if you're visiting, is uh, with Apologetics Press. He's in Montgomery, Alabama, executive director for over 10 years and very great defender of our truth. And he travels all over this country, very busy. I noticed this spring he'll be in California, Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, and Georgia, and other places. And so we're blessed to have him today. And uh, he has authored a lot of books and materials, and a lot of those are available in the back after if you'd like to see some of those. But uh, we're blessed to have Brother Dave Miller with us today, and you'll be blessed by his message. And this time I give you Brother Dave. In our session this morning, we were looking at evidences of the spiritual and moral and religious orientation of our nation from the very beginning. I want to take you through just a couple more of those. Is that it? Yes. Okay, take a look at this one. New batteries, can't be that. All right, I've shown you <clears throat> uh, several political documents, and there, there are so many more. It's astounding. When you go back and look at what the founders said in writing, not just in private letters, they did a lot of that too, but just talked about uh, the laws of our making. They're loaded with God, Bible, Scripture. It's on our money. It's in our national symbols. It's in our national architecture. The presidents uh, conclude their oaths, so help me God, and so do uh, other uh, civil oaths that are taken. Our public school education at one time was literally dominated by a worldview based on the Bible and Christianity. Uh, there was no hesitation to teach kids the Bible. Uh, there was concern about letting, you know, the Baptists or the Methodists or whatever give their slant. That's generally been avoided in our country. And some people fear, well, we don't want to go back to that because whose slant are you going to give? Well, they weren't giving their slant for all those years. You know, for example, during World War II, I've had elderly people come up to me that were children. They said every morning in our public school classes during World War II, we had a prayer for our soldiers that were overseas. Well, would we do that now? But that was just understood. That, that fit in with it. They had a Bible reading. And what could be wrong with having a child stand up and read a portion of the Bible to the class in public school? It's not promoting any one view except Christianity. That was commonplace in our country. It was the standard. We had national songs. Do you realize how many towns and cities are named after Bible names? This is just a listing of Alabama. I looked on a map and just quickly jotted down names of Alabama towns taken right out of the Bible. By the way, have you ever been to Paradise, Texas? And then think of our cemeteries. You know, what's the ACLU going to do about that? Because they're loaded with, you know, scriptures on tombstones, crosses everywhere. They indicate that heritage. And by the way, we have a number of military cemeteries scattered around the world where we've been involved in conflict, World War I, World War II. And all of those cemeteries, this is the one overlooking uh, the English Channel, where thousands of our young boys in 1943 died storming the beaches of Normandy. This is overlooking Omaha Beach. And, uh, you know, some parents wanted the bodies of their children returned to the States. Those who were fine with them being buried, that's where they were buried. And in every one of those, there are white, big white crosses. So, we can't look at that any further, but I, I assure you, our history, our background, our country is loaded. You know, even though for 50 years they've been doing everything they could to eradicate public indications of our religious heritage. I mean, they've been working hard overtime. 
and yet many are still there, which proves it's been thoroughly embedded in our culture and our civilization from the very beginning. It's always been there. Now, for this session and our final session this afternoon, which I hope you'll stay for, we want to answer the question, what, what can the righteous do? Given the direction, we see where we've been. Thoroughly wetted toward Christianity and the Bible and the God of the Bible. Now, you know the circumstances we're in with all of these challenges. What can we do? Let me give you uh, eight very practical Bible concepts that everybody in this room can do to help our nation. Number one, look at yourself. Look at yourself. Because you see, you and I have no hope of changing anybody in this, in this country if we've not paid attention to how we are living and ask ourselves the question, how dedicated am I? How dedicated am I? I told you that Maybe I didn't tell you that 60% of Americans don't even go to church. So you've got people that would still pay verbal allegiance to God and Christianity, but it really doesn't make that much difference in their lives. They conduct their business without really considering what Jesus would have them to do. Well, listen, if the most religious, moral, um, church-oriented people in the country are not dedicated to God, how can you expect the rest of the country to be? Can you imagine standing before God at the end of time and saying, and him saying, you know, as America was going down the tubes, you sure weren't much help. You were part of the problem. So you see, before we go change Washington or anybody else, what about us? We must determine that as times grow darker spiritually in our country, we are going to be ready to meet God at any moment. And we are going to be part of the solution, not the problem. We're going to be faithful. We're going to be dedicated. Go to the elders and ask them what you can do uh, to help the cause of Christ. They'll probably clutch their chest and have a slight heart tremor or something, but they'll probably have good things to tell you to do. That was supposed to be funny. <clears throat> Number two. How much time, really, honestly, how much time do you spend looking into God's Word? Is he um, offended at how much attention you put on other things? And I don't mean by this simply, you know, the more Bible you know, the better you're equipped, the more righteous you can be, the more you can function. That's certainly true. You know, I wish the Congress would uh, do something like uh, clear their desks and everybody get a, a free Bible and open it up. And for the next six months, all of our Congress and senators just sit there and read the Bible. What do you think? How do you think God would feel about that? And not only would we not have to worry about what they're doing up there for the next six months, but maybe they would be benefited from that and get realigned, reset as to really what life is about. Would that not help to inform them in their decisions for us? Well, it's clear to me that the founders were very concerned about God's thinking on matters. And they saw that as part of their responsibility for God to back them. For example, James McHenry, who served as Secretary of War under two pre first two presidents and signed the Constitution, quintessential founder, the Holy Scriptures can alone secure to society order and peace into our courts of justice and constitutions of government, purity, stability, and usefulness. Notice that word alone. Not anything else can do that. In vain, without the Bible, we increase penal laws and draw entrenchments around our institutions. Isn't that exactly what we're doing? Every time somebody gets shot, they want to make a bunch more gun laws. You know we're building prisons as fast as we can and letting hardened criminals out the back door because we don't have room for the new ones. That's been going on for years. We had to create a whole national security administration so we could frisk 
you know, 90-year-old women at the airport. We're doing everything we can. We're, we're spending billions of dollars, putting Band-Aids all over the place. And did you hear what he said? You're wasting your time. That's the meaning of in vain. You are increasing penal laws. You're drawing entrenchments around your institutions. You're doing it with no ultimate value. You're wasting your time. Why? Because Bibles are strong entrenchments. Where they abound, men cannot pursue wicked courses. See, we would do better flooding our prison system with Bibles. Notice that you can be a chaplain and go into a, a prison. You can't do that in public school. We want to wait until we turn them into criminals, then we'll take the Bible in there, you see, and let all the Muslims in too to teach our, our, prison, our criminals how to become Muslims. Isn't that a wacky society? We ought to be flooding our civilization with Bibles. Do you know that the founders twice during the eight years of the Revolutionary War made arrangements for thousands of Bibles to be distributed in our nation? Congress did that, the Continental Congress. When was the last time you heard Congress do anything like that in your lifetime? They won't even allow the Gideons to give out those neat little Bibles that they gave us when we were kids in school. That's, that's being quashed everywhere in the country. Well, all right, we're committing national suicide. These men understood we have to have the Bible and show God we respect it. Moving out of the founding era, here was the Speaker of the House, men in a word must necessarily be controlled either by a power within them or by a power without them, either by the word of God or the strong arm of man. It's either going to be by the Bible or the bayonet. Do you know what we as a civilization have opted for? The bayonet. Yeah. We'll increase our policemen and security and everything and try to catch up with all these criminals, but we're not going to do anything to actually change their hearts and minds where they won't be that way. Oh, we can't do that. They understood the Bible's the key to a civil society. You ever heard of the American Bible Society? <clears throat> Started back about the time of the founding era. Why? What's their purpose? To establish without delay a general Bible institution for the circulation of the Holy Scriptures without note or comment. Nobody gets to put in their views. We just want to get Bibles out there. I found this uh, Constitution online, and I could not believe it. When I looked at the first officers of the American Bible Society, it's a listing, a sort of a who's who of the founders. Beginning with its president, Elias Boudinot, very prominent founder, John Jay, first U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice, and right on down the line. The founders of our country, they were so busy writing the Declaration and all that, they found time to be in a Bible society for the purpose of getting Bibles out there in the, among the population? What's the connection between those two? Well, they had different views on that matter than, than prevail today. Number three, do you, how many of you are old enough to remember when preachers said, uh, as the family goes, so goes the country? Well, we've lived long enough to see. It's happened. If you, think, if you think our country is in shambles, morally and spiritually, look at the home. You know, prior to 1963, the divorce rate in this country was extremely low, and it stayed at that level. 1963, uh, sociologists say the divorce rate commenced to skyrocket. By 1980, it passed death as the leading cause of family breakup. And for many, many years, one million children every year go through divorce courts with their parents. That's been going on for decades now. So you see when, when what, four, five of the justices said, you know what, a home can consist of two men or two women. And we're horrified. Well, just understand, the dissolution of the biblical definition of marriage and home and family began back in the 60s. We're simply seeing the outcome, the fruition. Marriage was already under heavy attack before. So, 
We want to know what to do to try to help our country and turn it around? Work on the family. That's obvious. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, God brought into existence the first human beings, and the first thing he created was the home. I mean, that's before the church as far as being visibly on earth. 4,000 years earlier. Why? Because the home is the building block of the human race and of nations, of societies. So the more attention we give to the spiritual and moral and emotional, psychological health of the family, the more we're going to help our country. You know, welfare is wrong for many Bible reasons. Bible reasons. It's wrong. It is not a fulfillment of the Bible command to be concerned about the needy and the poor. Because God tells us how to deal with that. And welfare pretty much does everything the opposite of what God says to do in that situation and redefines the word poor. But one of the road to crime. Not all of them. I think Freed's outstanding. Great president. But so many of our schools have become...